thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost hast instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail, Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Philomena, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Poor Protestants, Martin Luther cut you off from the mystical body of Christ. Poor Protestants, they belong to the mystical finger, but not the mystical body of Christ. And today we're going to consider this last <clears throat> part of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the communion of saints. <clears throat> the forgiveness of sins, and then the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So, what is the communion of saints? And what does it mean, the forgiveness of sins? The communion of saints, what is meant by that? The communion of saints, says the Catechism, is meant the union of the faithful on earth, the blessed in heaven, and the souls in purgatory with Christ as their head. So the Catholic Church is not just a denomination. It's a living body attached to a head. And what attaches the body to the head is the union of grace. St. Divine Grace, which is a, brings the true living faith, the true understanding of living faith, and one, they also must believe in all that Christ taught since they reached the age of reason. So little babies who are baptized, they don't have the use of reason, but they have the supernatural infused virtue of faith in them. And when they've developed the age of reason, they must make an explicit act of belief in what Christ taught. And... This union with the mystical body, and this union with <clears throat> all the saints who are in heaven, who are in purgatory, and who are on earth battling, this makes up what's called the communion of saints. So I say poor Protestants because the poor Protestants, in their erroneous belief, as St. Peter says, Many interpret scripture. There are many things in scripture, he says in his epistle, second book, the last chapter. In there he says, there's many things in scripture that are hard to be understood and difficult to understand. And many, he says, will interpret the scripture to their own destruction. And that's what all the false Christian denominations do. They interpret Scripture to their destruction because they reject what Christ loves and instituted, which is His mystical body, the Catholic Church. So it's a real body. I am the vine, you are the branches. There is a, a living connection between the branches and the vine. And Christ is the head and we are His members, the mystical body of Christ. The Church triumphant, of course, are the saints in heaven. The Church suffering is the souls in purgatory, who die in the state of grace, but have temporal punishment due to sin. And the souls in purgatory, they do suffer. They do suffer. They burn. Some of them freeze. And it's far harder than anything on earth. There are, in, in Rome, there you can see uh, an old museum. The modernists don't like it, so you have to really... Uh, find your way and work between all their crazy time schedule to get there. But there is in the sacristy of this church, for the, it's a museum of all the artifacts of souls who have appeared and asked prayers for, from purgatory. 
So in there you'll see a table with a priest who put his hand on the table and burnt his hand in. He just touched it for a moment and said, pray for me, I'm in purgatory. Also, um, there is a book, The Imitation of Christ, and a nun was reading it in her cell. And another sister who had died previously, just a, a week or so before that, the sisters kind of gave up praying for her because they thought she was so holy and she obeyed the rule and she died a holy death. Surely she must be in heaven. And uh, sure enough, that soul appeared to one of the nuns in flames. And she said, pray for me, I am in purgatory. She put her hand on the book and just touched it for a moment and her fingers burnt at least one to two inches deep into the pages. Now you can have a really hot iron, touch it to a book, touch it to a cloth, and it won't burn a hole. So they're burning very hot. In that museum you'll also see a shirt sleeve of a boy who stopped praying for his mother. And she appeared to him, put her hand on his sleeve and said, Son, why did you forget me? And vanished. And he continued to pray for her and got masses said for her. And she appeared to him, radiant with glory, saying, Thanks for your prayers, I get to go home. St. Francis de Sales says about the souls in purgatory, he says that although they do suffer, they are nevertheless at peace, because they're perfectly conformed to God's will, because God in his mercy created purgatory as a place of mercy, because nothing undefiled, nothing impure, Nothing unworthy can come before the throne of God. So purgatory is a mercy of God, otherwise no one would, hardly anyone would get to heaven. So what it does is purges the soul so that through those flames it comes out loving God perfectly. It satisfies the justice because when we sin we offend God's justice. And it's called temporal punishment due to sin. And, it, and when they're released they love God to the maximum, and they, they go to heaven. They're also in the state of grace, and they're also going home to heaven. So they're happy and at peace. They're suffering much, but they're happy and at peace. Uh, as we priests deal with many times, <clears throat> people will ask, Father, I hear footsteps in the room upstairs. Father, I hear... I see, like in St. Mary's, Kansas, there was this famous ghost many years ago. And the, one of the inhabitants of one of the rooms there was so used to having this ghost around that he would see the, the imprint of his sitting down on his bed or on the couch and hear it walking around. So there's many ghost stories, as we, St. Paul says, test the spirits. But a lot of these so-called ghost stories are actually souls from purgatory coming back to earth, especially where they might have lived or died, and God permits them to haunt the place that, around which they lived or died, mainly to ask for prayers. So people, this happens actually quite often. They call the priest, Father, can, what is this? A devil? Is it? An, I don't know what it is. So we have to see, is it violent, is it, is it um, threaten people's lives, does it scratch them? I know a case where a, a two-year-old baby was scratched by this thing in the house, and it was no doubt devils, because the claws, the doctor when he examined the baby's claw marks, which were bleeding, fresh blood, he said these not only were fast claws, but he said they were burning hot. They were burning hot claws. And this boy is now 20 years old and he's got the scars to show it. And uh, so the devil, you got to see if it's the devil, as St. Paul says, or the soul of purgatory. Often it's the soul of purgatory, <clears throat> asking for prayers. So it's very important for anybody, if you've got footsteps in your house, things are moved, you put the ladder here, and tomorrow, and the next day, it's down in the basement, and you didn't put it there. Uh, uh, the lady in the kitchen, the mother, 
puts the utensils on one side, she comes down in the morning and they're all on the other side. These quiet little harmless things of so-called ghosts are often souls of purgatory. And it's actually quite, quite often we encounter this. And it's part of God's mercy that he allows them to ask for prayers. Because in the new religion of Vatican II, in the new church, all their funerals are done in white. And that's a lie. The Holy Ghost doesn't lie. The Holy, true Holy Ghost of the true Holy Roman Catholic Church, the masses for the dead are in black, with the only exception of babies who are baptized and die before the age of reason. Their souls are little saints. But after the age of reason, they can sin. So the, the funeral masses are in black. And that's truthful, because they might need prayers in purgatory. But the new church, with the new mass, with the new sacraments, and the new priesthood, and the new bastard mass, as Archbishop Lefebvre called it, the illeg illegitimate mass, and he said many times himself, don't go to that mass, it's extremely dangerous to your faith, don't go. It's better to wait and go to a Tridentine, a true Catholic Mass of priests who don't compromise. Better to go every several months than to go every Sunday to the new Mass. Because it will poison you and make you lose your faith. And that's what Archbishop Lefebvre held. That's what we priests of his sons, his true sons, hold by that. And his true position. The, the resistance of Our Lady Mount Carmel here. Father Cordoso, Father Rafael, and down in uh, Ecuador, near Our Lady of, of Good Success, and Father Ribas in Spain, and all these few priests who are just holding the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. And that's where we have to be, with the truth. So, souls in purgatory need our prayers. They suffer much. You can read a very good book called Purgatory by Father F. X. Schoop, a Jesuit priest who wrote it, I think, in the 1800s or early 1900s. Excellent book, excellent book, full of stories of saints who had actually talked with souls of purgatory and are visited there. <clears throat> Some souls are in purgatory till the end of the world. Remember at Fatima, the little children asked the Virgin Mary, what about Amelia, this little girl that died a teenage girl, I suppose, who died in Fatima. The girls knew her. And the Virgin Mary said, pray for her. She's in purgatory till the end of the world. <laughs> so we know nuns, priests in purgatory for centuries. And we know even saints. Saint Severus of Cologne in Germany had to spend six months in purgatory because for being negligent in, or speed reading his divine office. So, so, purgatory is real, and uh, it's, it's part of God's mercy. The Protestants, I don't know why, but they deny it, but it hinges on their false heresies on state of grace. And, um, but it's, it does exist, and whether Protestants believe it or not, it exists. And in the book of Maccabees it says it's a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they might be loosed from their sins. If they're in hell, they can't ever be loosed. They're damned forever. If they're in heaven, they have no sins to be loosed from. So that must mean there's a place where they are suffering for sins, and they'll pay for it to the last penny, says St. Paul, and uh, where they can be loosed from their sins and helped by our prayers. And that, of course, is purgatory. And then, um, um, uh, we are f all familiar with this the church militant. And notice, this is the teaching of the Catholic Church, especially the Council of Trent brought this out. We belong to the church militant. We are confirmed by confirmation. Not to pretend and run around and say we're saved, which is also a lie. Christ himself says, be vigilant and watch, lest you enter into temptation. St. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're automatically saved and we're going to heaven. No way, it doesn't say that. And it's called the church militant because we got to fight every day to get there. And we got three big enemies that are always trying to drag us to hell. 
One enemy is inside us, two enemies are outside of us. The enemy inside us is the concupiscence of the flesh, the disorders of pride, gluttony, sloth, lust, avarice, envy, the seven capital sins. They're in us, and by original sin we are prone towards evil. So we have to fight always with prayer, frequent confession, frequent communion, at least spiritual communion if you don't have the true Mass, without compromise. And then we have the two enemies outside, which are the spirit of the world, with its bad music, its bad movies, its bad jokes, its bad, its whole humor that centers on worldliness and the, the denial of adoration and humility towards God. And then, of course, the big enemy of the devil, and many devils who are always attacking. Here at the seminary, there's no doubt, many, many devils attacking. St. Bernard, when he was walking with his monks, the Cistercians, he looked up to the monastery where they're on the hill or in the valley, and, and he showed the monks, look, and they could see thousands of devils attacking the monastery. And over there you could see, see the town, and there was only a few fat black devils sitting around, because most people were in their claws, living in mortal sin. But in the monastery they're fighting to live always in the state of grace and to gain heaven. So the devils are always attacking. So we belong to the church militant, which means we have to fight to get to heaven. It's a battle. It's a warfare on this earth. And the Holy Catholic Church, as compared to, by Christ to the ship on which St. Peter is the Pope and the head, this ship is being constantly attacked and bombarded down her history. We're 2,017 years now. The Catholic Church, since Christ died on the cross, 2,000 years she's been bombarded from within, from without, from everywhere. Air attack, submarines, and many times she looks like St. Pius X says, she looks like she's almost sinking. Or St. Gregory the Great says, in his day the church was like a battered ship on the verge of sinking. So, but she'll never be destroyed. Christ said, the gates of hell will never prevail. So these, all the union of the saints in heaven, they pray for the souls in purgatory. The saints in heaven intercede for us on earth battling. And the veneration of saints is so normal, I can't believe Protestants deny this. On earth, Protestants will ask their cousins, can you help us out? We're in, we're in trouble. Can you maybe... Get, 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 some, get us a job or send us some money, some help. They appeal to their own family members and friends for help. If that's how it is on earth, all the more we can appeal to our friends in heaven. And if Christ is honored by his saints being honored. It says in the scriptures, which is also the introit of the Mass for many apostles, to me, my friends, says Christ, are exceedingly honored. And Archbishop Lefebvre, he used to say that many of the pagan Africans, the pagan Africans, many of them had kings, who the higher the king was, the more powerful he was, the more servants he had, and the more ranks of officers, and that gave him greater honor. And when these pagan Africans walked into a Catholic church, they would see Christ on the cross, the holy tabernacle with the burning lamp showing Christ is there, the head, the head of the mystical body. Then they saw hundreds of statues of saints all down the aisle and the stations of the cross, and stained glass windows showing lives of saints. So they would say, your king must be the most powerful, the most highest, because look at all his servants, look at all the rank of his officers. And many converted because they saw the friends of God give glory to Christ the King. And that's why the saints intercede for us. They are in heaven, as St. John Chrysostom, they're in the bleachers watching the field of battle, or the ice rink here. And we're the ones on earth battling down here against the enemy. And they're up in the stadium 
of heaven with the angels cheering us on. St. John Chrysostom says. And Christ doesn't sit on the sidelines. He's in there fighting with us. So the church triumphant, we can appeal to their help like St. Anthony. When you lose something, St. Anthony, you pray to him. He'll always find it. May not be all right on time, but he'll always find it. We have so many, so many saints to turn to. St. Philomena, she's famous. St. John Vianney made her famous, and uh, she's very powerful. Because Christ is honored by his friends. And the proof that God is honored by his friends, he honors many of them with miracles during their life and even after their death, such as the incorrupt body of St. Bernadette. Look it up. You can see her, she looks like she's sleeping. There's no formaldehyde chemicals in her. There's no humidifiers to keep her skin tender. She just lies there sleeping in a convent. St. Thomas de Corey also, he died in the 1700s, George Washington's day. And he's lying there with a smile and you can see his whiskers, the veins in his hands. He was a holy Franciscan who at mass would elevate off the ground, who drove the devil out of souls and saw the child Jesus sometimes on the altar. And one time the child Jesus patted him on the head at Mass. <laughs> so uh, God shows many, many saints his, his approval by granting miracles. And that's helpful to us to realize that we can pray to them for help. And they do help us because they know what a fight we're in. They know we're, we... They were on earth too, and they had to fight. And they could have gone to hell if they weren't faithful also. So they know the danger we're constantly in. And that's why we must pray. Pray to the, to the heart of Jesus, to the heart of Mary, and to the saints. And this is the sadness of Protestantism, because it isolates them, cuts them off from this union of all these friends and saints and champions of battle, and, and it's just the sole survivor to battle his own way to heaven. But Christ never established the mystical finger of Christ. He never taught this. He taught the mystical body of Christ. And St. Paul will say this also, that we are members of his body. He is the head and we are the members. So through the communion of saints, says the Catechism, the blessed in heaven can help the souls in purgatory and the faithful on earth by praying for them, and they do. And you might have family and relatives who are in heaven already. And you can ask their help, and they do intercede. So, um, are the prayers of the blessed in heaven always efficacious? Because they are always in the accord with the God's will. They are. They're always efficacious because their prayers are they're, they're friends of God. And here Tobias, the scripture says, Tobias chapter 12, verse 12, when this is the angel speaking to Tobias to show that God hears the prayers of his friends even on earth. When thou didst pray with tears, and didst bury the dead, and didst, have thy, didst leave thy dinner, and hide the dead and by day in thy house, and bury them at night, I offered thy prayer to the Lord, says the angel. So he offered all his good works, burying the dead, his prayers, uh, during that time of persecution. So, should the faithful on earth, through the communion of saints, honor the blessed in heaven and pray to them? The Catechism teaches, The faithful on earth, through the communion of saints, should honor the blessed in heaven and pray to them, because they are worthy of honor and as friends of God will help the faithful on earth. And of course, on November 1st, we have the Feast of All Saints, where all of the saints canonized, uncanonized, Babies who died after baptism, before the age of reason, all these saints are honored. And then a quote from scripture to refute the Protestant heresies who say, don't pray to the saints, don't, that's, that's false, that's idolatry, uh, uh, intercession of saints. Ecclesiasticus 44, verse 1, says, Let us now praise men of renown and our fathers, 
in their generation. Praise them and honor them. And they're not just dead when their bodies are buried. Their soul lives on and they can intercede for us. Can the faithful on earth, through the communion of saints, relieve the suffering of the souls in purgatory? Yes, the faithful on earth, through communion of saints, can relieve the sufferings of the souls in purgatory by prayer, fasting, and other good works, prayers with indulgences, and by having masses said for them. St. Gregory the Great offered 30 masses for a soul in purgatory. After the 30th Mass, he saw that soul rise to heaven, grateful, happy, and going to glory. St. Vincent Ferrer, his sister was kind of wild in her life. She died. She was sentenced to purgatory till the end of the world. He offered 30 Masses for her in a row. That's called the Gregorian Mass. And he saw her soul after the 30th Mass, saw her soul rise to heaven. So that's the power of the Mass. And to gain indulgences for the souls in purgatory. Can the faithful on earth help one another? Now this is an obvious. Not only physically can we help each other, such as uh, helping someone move into their house, or building a new house, or if it burnt down. The faithful on earth as members of the mystical body of Christ can help each other by practicing supernatural charity, and especially by performing the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. And one of those is praying for them. And many times, many good fathers and mothers, their wayward children, they try to talk to them, they try to send them books, they try to reach them, and their hearts are hardened. And so, what can you do? Well, you can pray for them. Like St. Monica prayed 30 years for the conversion of her son and God finally heard her prayer after 30 years and her son converted and became one of the greatest doctors of the Catholic Church, St. Augustine. So, um, what is meant at the end of the Apostles' Creed when we say <coughs> the forgiveness of sins? I believe in the forgiveness of sins. This is a very important one, because when we go to confession and we're really sorry for our sins, our Lord really forgives. He really forgives because He loves your soul. He died for it. By the forgiveness of sins is meant that God has given to the church through Jesus Christ the power to forgive sins no matter how great or how many they are if the sinner is truly repentant and our Lord never refuses a contrite and humble soul he will always forgive and this is the greatness of the sacrament of confession which Christ instituted and then finally the lesson 14 the resurrection and life everlasting what is meant by the resurrection of the body this means that at the end of the world, the bodies of all men will rise from the earth and be united again to their souls, never more to be separated. So, as the Apocalypse says, and our Lord says in St. Matthew's Gospel, the angels will blow the trumpets and all the cemeteries will come to life and all the dead will rise, everyone, and even people who are pagan ritually cremated, which is a pagan practice that's coming back again, and they sprinkle their ashes in the ocean, well the angels will dig up those DNA ashes, and, and by the power of Christ the King, all the bodies will receive a new flesh. And St. Thomas says, all will rise about the age of 30 years old. They'll be young, they'll be vibrant, they'll be strong, they'll be handsome, they'll be beautiful. All defects will be gone. The old will be risen young. If you add seven fingers on your hand, you'll be back to five, because all defects will be erased. And people will look much the same, but defects will be excluded. 
And some people thought that those who are going to hell, they're going to rise all twisted and grotesque and deformed. But St. Thomas Aquinas says, no, all will rise with good, strong, healthy bodies, but the damned, their bodies will suffer forever in the fires of hell with the soul. So the flames will burn right up into their heart, their esophagus, their liver, into the bloodstream. Who of us can endure eternal fires, says the scriptures. So the bodies of the just will rise glorious. And has the body of any human person ever been glorified and taken into heaven? Well, of course, Christ ascended into heaven by his own power. And by the special privilege of her assumption, the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary, united to her immaculate soul, was glorified and taken into heaven. So this is the great truth of Mary's assumption, which the apostles witnessed and has always been believed. And Pius XII declared it a great dogma in 1950. It's not a new belief, it always was believed. So no pope is allowed to make a new doctrine. And this is the problem with the Vatican II popes, if they've invented a new doctrine, collegiality, religious liberty, which the church always condemned, ecumenism, freedom of conscience, and all these in the new mass, all these are new ideas in the church, and they attack the Catholic faith. So as long as these bad popes are pushed for Vatican II, we have to oppose them. And we wait and fight on until we have a good pope. As Archbishop Lefebvre told his four bishops, keep tradition, don't seek a false agreement with Rome, and stay united in the true faith until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. We don't have a perfectly Catholic Pope, that's for sure. So what is Bishop Follet doing, putting all these families and priests in the jaws of these modernists who will destroy them? Just like all the 11 to 12 traditional groups who have gone under modernist Rome, they've all been smashed, made to accept the new mass, modernism, and they end up losing the faith. That's why we have to fight for the faith, and not by some fake resistance either, with, with uh, fuzzy terms about the new mass, and it's okay to go, and you can go to St. Vicantus Mass, or Phineite Mass, and Vatican II wasn't all that bad, and you can accept some of it, and it gives grace, and it, the, the new church is part of the real church, the Catholic Church, no. The fake resistance stands on sand. We stay with the resistance of Archbishop Lefebvre, of all the popes of tradition, and the head of that resistance is the Virgin Mary herself, the twelve star crown generalissima. So, our Blessed Mother, um, this chapter would require a longer time, but let me just summarize with four things. What will the resurrected bodies be? What are the qualities of a resurrected body? We see in our Lord Jesus Christ, He shined brighter than the sun. That's called clarity. So the state of grace of each member of Christ's mystical body, the, the light of grace will shine through the body. So all the saints will shine with different degrees of wattage. There will be a different watt for each saint. But it will show the love of God that will shine through them, the sanctifying grace. Second quality is agility. They'll be able to fly through the air. And the, the, the soul will command the body. Here on earth, the body, if we want to go <coughs> up the hill to the chapel, well, i got to get up, walk up there, and move my body. But with the resurrected body, you just will to go, and your body will, f will obey and fly. You can walk if you want, you can fly, you can do backflips if you want, no problem. The next uh, quality is impassibility. You won't get sick, no colds, you won't get old, you won't have broken bones. So the football games and hockey games will be, can be as violent as you want. They won't be no stretchers and no knockouts or, nor concussions. And then uh, uh, the body won't get hurt. So this impassibility is one of those great qualities because Christ had this. His body now is forever perfect. 
always. And then the last quality is subtlety, you'll be able to pass through matter. So you won't need tunnels through the, through the mountains, you just pass through the mountain. And we know this because Christ passed through the walls of the Virgin Mary at his birth. It was a miraculous birth. He did not pass through the normal channels. He passed through the womb of the Virgin Mary miraculously. As St. Gregory the Great teaches, and her virginity was completely intact. So, at his birth, and of course after his resurrection, Christ passed through the walls and appeared to his twelve apostles, and he did this more than once. And then, um, these qualities will shine in heaven. But the damned in hell, they won't have these qualities, but the body will be strong and vigorous, but it will only suffer forever in hell to share in the misery and sadness and eternal despair and eternity of hell. Never to get out. Never to have a refreshment. Never to have a coffee break. Never to have a nice uh, night's, night's rest. Never to have a refreshing cold glass of beer or water. It won't exist. All they will do is hate God hate their life that they messed up, and just hate everybody. That's all it is in hell, is hate. And they burn. So, and they, they hate Christ. If Christ came down into hell right now, and said, I offer you forgiveness, they would spit on him and blaspheme him. Every one of them. Because the damned are fixed in hatred of God. Because mortal sin turns the heart from God, and the will, and it brings death to the soul. And mortal sin brings death to a member of Christ's mystical body. If he's in mortal sin, he's a dead member. And if he dies in that state, he's never anymore a member of Christ's mystical body. So that's why it's so important that we strive to live in the state of grace and understand that we want to stay united to Christ and the true mystical body of Christ, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, of tradition, not Vatican II, the new invention of 1965, with its new Mass. So um, maybe next time we'll continue with this chapter, um, and Father Pfeiffer and I are kind of alternating with the Catechism. So we hope this will be helpful for your souls, battle on, and keep the daily rosary. We'll finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of death. Amen. Saint Joseph, <coughs> pray for us. Saint Anthony, pray for us. Saint Pius X, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.